Today on A Novel Review, a mantelpiece moment that reflects the makings of a classic. A novel that probes some of the deepest questions man faces and, as always, what novel am I pulling down from that precarious pile on my bedside table? All of that and more today on A Novel Review. Hello and welcome to the literature podcast, A Novel Review. My name is Seamus, your host, and together we will discuss, dissect, and explore the wonderful world of literature, and the wonderful world of literature is a vast and dense jungle, so let's start making our way through, one book at a time. Hello, hello, and welcome to the beginning of another episode of A Novel Review a podcast exploring the wonderful world of literature. My name is Seamus and I am your host, and for today's episode, Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov. But before I jump into this book, I always take a moment to reflect on any mantelpiece moments, something to highlight from the week past, and this week, I thought I would more pose a question. I'm in a Facebook group called Existential Literature, and A question was posted to the group the other day, which I am now extending to you, dear listener. What makes good literature? What makes good literature? It's a good question. It's a big question. One that I don't really have an answer for because literature is so vast that there can be multiple answers. The discourse of Shakespeare's verses, the philosophical writings of perhaps the man I will discuss today, Dostoevsky. How does one decide? Does it depend on their writing skill? And is the writing skill enough to make it a quality piece of literature, irrespective of the story itself? Or is the story engaging enough to render writing style less important? Perhaps it is something as simple. Perhaps the answer is something as simple as saying, it's how the literature makes you feel. A book that stays with you after you have closed it. A book that becomes a friend. It was an interesting thread of comments and discussions on that post on Facebook. At times, it it got a little heated, but it was always interesting, and if you have any thoughts, I would love to hear them. Housekeeping, as always, all the scripts from the episode are available on my website, just in case you know of anyone who has a hearing impairment who might get a kick out of a written version of the pod. So head along, they are all free for use for all to enjoy. Also, the episodes are available on YouTube with closed captions if that is more your cup of tea. This is a big one. The Brothers Karamazov. Hundreds of pages, hundreds of ideas. Too many to get through in a single podcast episode, which is why I'm probably doing it over two. This was my second time reading a Dostoevsky novel. The first was Crime and Punishment, and I did not think much of it when I read it. But after now reading this novel, The Brothers Karamazov, I think maybe I didn't understand Crime and Punishment, so it may be worth a reread. For many people, this is the greatest book ever written. I remember many people said that about Anna Karenina, and I completely disagreed and still disagree with that. So I was a little wary coming to this novel especially after not thinking much of Crime and Punishment as well. But still, I love a big book, and I love a large story that you can sink your teeth into and spend days and weeks reading. I love, I love being immersed and, and swept along by a story. It had been some time since I had last done this, so when the mood struck, I seized it. For a bit of background, The Brothers Karamazov was the last novel written by Fyodor Dostoevsky, and he spent nearly two years writing the novel. It was released as a serial from January 1879 to November 1880, nearly two years in the magazine The Russian Messenger. At this point in time, Dostoevsky was an established name, and the serial-slash-novel was well-received, and I mean, it's been around for, what, 143 years now, and it's still as popular as ever? It's clearly doing something right. Time is the ultimate conqueror, the ultimate equalizer, the ultimate judge of what is good and bad, 
And if something in art has stood the test of time, there must be something in it that warrants some attention and close inspection. Perhaps that is the answer to the earlier question about what makes good literature, something that stands the test of time. So maybe an overview to really kick off the story. I've gone for a bit of a long one today because this is a dense and complex novel and I made it up so long so that I'd almost have a reference point on what to touch on throughout the episode. So hopefully this makes sense and also lays the foundation for what's to come throughout the episode. Episodes, I should say. So here we go. The Brothers Karamazov is a profound and complex novel that delves into the intricate relationships, moral dilemmas, and spiritual struggles of three brothers living in 19th century Russia. The story is set in the fictional town of Skodoprogonovsk. Sorry, I, I, like I t completely just butchered that name, I know, but it is fictional, so hopefully I haven't offended anyone. Where the wealthy and debauched Fyodor Karamazov fathers three sons that each have different personalities and beliefs. Dmitri, the eldest and passionate, is entangled in a love triangle with the enchanting Grushenka, his fiancée, and his father's money leading to an intense conflict with his family. Ivan, the intellectual and sceptical second son, struggles with existential questions about God, morality, and the nature of evil. The younger son, Aloysia, is a gentle and compassionate novice monk torn between his spiritual calling and worldly temptations. The plot unfolds when Fyodor Karamazov is found murdered and the suspicion falls on Dmitri. The trial becomes the central focus of the novel, exposing the complex nature of human emotion, the influence of upbringing, and the struggle between reason and emotion. The story also revolves around the themes of faith, doubt, and the existence of God. Ivan's philosophical discussions with Aloysia reveal his torment over the problem of evil and culminate in the famous The Grand Inquisitor chapter where Ivan presents a parable questioning the need of God's presence in a world filled with suffering and injustice. Amidst the turmoil and philosophical debates, the novel explores the role of family, the consequence of human passions, and the power of redemption. The characters undergo profound transformations as they confront their inner demons and seek forgiveness and understanding. Throughout the narrative, Dostoevsky masterfully weaves together the themes of love, guilt, and redemption, offering a deep exploration into the human psyche and the intricacies of the human emotion. So there we have it. Three brothers with the story revolving mostly around the third brother, Aloysia, and his relationship with the other two. Fair, fair warning if you are not a fan of Russian names, and their changing, shifting nature, or if this is your first time dealing with the shifting nature, don't be afraid to look up a family tree and get a grasp on the names. Or do what I did and sketch your own family tree. But yeah, sometimes it can be chaos. This is one of the most deeply affecting novels I have ever read. It is big, and so sometimes your desire can be to get through it quickly but you should really take your time with this one. Buy a copy that you will not be afraid to mark, take notes or underline, and just have fun with it. It's a novel you want to read as well as process, and that takes time. I mean, it, it, it's a novel so big and reaches such a depth, I'm actually unsure where to begin. From the overview, I made it out like the father of these three brothers, Fyodor Karamazov, was an early event but it's not. It actually takes place closer to the middle of the book, and that is over 400 pages into it. The novel opens with overviews and scenes setting to the three brothers and discussing their upbringing, especially in relation to their father. For me initially, it did feel a bit overviewy, especially to start things off, but after that, when you get into the crux of the story, I understood why Dostoevsky had done this a bit better. The connection and relationship to the father is the unifying factor and for me really the only thing that ties these three brothers together. They are all different and established in their own way. 
For this reason, I'm going to move through the brothers ironically in an overview list kind of way, but just to give us a bit more background on them personally. Dimitri, as the eldest, comes to the picture wanting money. To be more exact, the inheritance he believed that he is owed from his father. During the initial stages of the novel, I was unsure who to trust and who was telling the truth between him and his father. Fyodor and Dimitri both claim that the money is theirs, and in fact they both are labelled sensualists, and therefore they're kind of echoes of each other. I felt like we didn't get much of Ivan in the early stages of the novel. He is portrayed as quiet, but I can't remember much of him in these early stages, and he felt more like someone lurking in the shadows of this novel, but this all changed for me when we get the Grand Inquisitor chapter. That was when he came alive on the page as a fleshed out character with ideas and beliefs worth discussing, but in summation, he is rational and calculating. And then there is Aloysia, poor sweet Aloysia, who I immediately had sympathy for as a faith filled individual who places his faith in the Lord and in the local Russian Orthodox monastery. And finally, just quickly, there is the father. Fyodor Pavlovich, the father of the three boys, and for me personally, he was just a force for evil. Now, I know that was sort of like a second overview. I did feel it was necessary to run through the three brothers on a personal level, as the story is about patricide, and so I think it's just good to understand them a bit more in depth, as well as the father a little bit as well, because he's a dick. So. I think this episode will deal with just about the first half of the novel, and then part two will cover the remainder. Yeah, it's, it, it's just one of those books that is so large. I, I already know a lot will be missed, but I promise I will do my best. Initially, as the story is unfolding, I, I felt glimmers of hope because I, well, I mean, I really had no idea where the story was going or what it was going to be about. But I had glimmers of hope that there was going to be a swift reconciliation in the family. The family meet up at the local monastery so that the elder Zosima can be a mediator between Fyodor Pavlovich and Dmitri about the inheritance. However, this scene becomes awkward and cringy, not from a writing or storytelling perspective, but because it becomes clear that Fyodor Pavlovich has only asked for the meeting to take place here as a joke and is purposely provocative towards the situation. This scene is foundational for the rest of the novel because you have been told how Fyodor Pavlovich is a sensualist, this kind of immoral, selfish person. And at least for me, whenever I read a character like this, I, I always have this, this tiny thread of hope that they're not actually as immoral as they seem. They're not actually as passion driven and selfish that there is something that governs them there is something above them this sense of moral order to them some baseline respect that 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 carries them through the day but alas it is clear he doesn't and this plays out through this scene it plays out as this kind of duality between him and father zosma who is the spiritual advisor in the monastery of the town and he also happens to be aloysia's teacher now Father Zosima is this really fascinating character and has a many really beautiful thought-provoking passages, though unfortunately he is old and he dies quite early in the story. Dostoevsky actually wrote him into the story. He wanted to use Zosima as a betrayal of the church as a positive force in society. But what I love about Zosima is he is so acutely aware of the situation and I feel knows that Fyodor Pavlovich is trying to take the piss out of the church and respect in general. And Zosima doesn't get angry, but instead cuts you to the root core of who you are. This is just one quote that Zosima says, and he says, quote,
end quote. Mm. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Simple, elegant, and yet so hard-hitting. Zosima is able to size up the measure of a man so acutely. And it's, it's, it's true. It's, it's so easy to make excuses and to lie to ourselves about how our lives are turning out. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that everyone has a level playing field or some capitalist idea of working hard until you drop to try and make some money, but more that life is how you present yourself and that you're in control of your own life. This idea that Zosima puts forth is reinforced a bit later in the story, so I will get to that, but it's these kind of passages that make you slow down and reread them before moving on. I repeat, this is not a book to be rushed, but rather indulged. After this meeting, the story unfolds with this rapid nature that makes it feel almost like the film Uncut Gems, if anyone has seen that with, with Adam Sandler. Aloysia has to handle some things outside of the monastery and is told to go, despite the fact that Father Zosima is now dying, but he still tells Aloysia to go and that he will be fine until Aloysia returns. As the reader, I was sceptical, and it seems to be that everywhere Aloysia goes from here, he is always pulled into a side conversation, or a, or a side quest distracting him from his initial intentions. For this reason, I found this part of the book really stressful, because these five-minute conversations he kept having always seemed to go on for hours, and I was worried that the poor lad wouldn't make it back in time before Father Zosima dies. Full disclosure, there may have been some selfish reasons here, because I also wanted more Zosima content, and if he dies off screen, I would have been a little pissed. What is interesting in this period of the novel is that we learn that the father-son beef between Fyodor Pavlovich and Dmitri is not just financially driven, but it's also a love triangle between a woman, Grushenka. Now, Dmitri is engaged to Katerina Ivanova, despite his love for Grushenka, and it's this love triangle that only serves to add more tension and anger to the situation facing the father and son. And I also think that with Father Zosima's words freshly echoing through your ears, you can't help but wonder about how many issues in this novel could have been solved and resolved if there was some honesty, some honour among these men. If they didn't just lie to themselves about what they wanted. But alas, that is rarely how the world works. This is actually a really important point. One that I will touch on later, but it's one about responsibility. At its core, the novel is a murder mystery. Fyodor Pavlovich is murdered, and the question arises, who did it? Fyodor Pavlovich is a bad, bad dude, just this force for evil, so his murder is not that much of a surprise. But when it happens, you are kind of certain you think you know who did it. But then doubt creeps in page by page. And what is fascinating is, the novel turns and begins to explore this notion of responsibility through this murder case, this notion of responsibility for a murder. This is now building upon what Father Zosima had explored in his passage about lying to yourself. We have to take responsibility for our lives, our actions, and understand that we do not exist in a vacuum, and what we do has consequences. I know this probably seems quick, but I have to move on to the Grand Inquisitor chapter. Otherwise, we will, uh, like, we will legitimately be here all day, but also because this chapter is brilliant. If you haven't read the novel, you might be thinking, why do we have to talk about a specific chapter? Well, basically, it's a chapter with Aloysia the Faithful and Ivan the Cold and Rational talking, and Ivan has written a poem detailing a Spanish inquisitor from the 16th century's encounter with Jesus Christ who has returned to earth. This chapter does not feel out of place, and in fact, feels quite timely from the philosophical sentiments that have been building so far throughout the story. The Grand Inquisitor is a 
thought-provoking chapter that stands as a captivating exploration of the complex interplay between human freedom and the allure of authority. This chapter presents a parable within the larger narrative where Ivan shares this tale of the Grand Inquisitor's encounter with Jesus Christ during the Spanish Inquisition. This essay delves into the themes and philosophical implications of the Grand Inquisitor, shedding light on its examination of faith, individuality, and the tension between personal liberty and societal control. During the Spanish Inquisition, Jesus comes back to earth, but it is made clear that this is not the prophesied return like it says in the Bible. This is just a side quest of sorts, and I and I, I like I love that. I mean, in the whole first half of the book, you get Aloysia just on side quest after side quest, and then all of a sudden we've got Jesus on a side quest. So I, I simply loved it for that reason. But basically, the chapter is a dialogue between the Grand Inquisitor, who is a leader of the Spanish Inquisition, and Jesus. The Inquisitor details how, through the biblical text and discussing the three temptations, Christ has actually put humanity in a worse-off position. One example in the text is that of bread. While fasting for 40 days in the desert, Jesus is approached by Satan, and Satan tells him to turn the rocks into bread. Jesus rejects this, basically saying that you do not need earthly pleasures, but the pleasures of belief in God. This inquisitor laments that, this is unfair and that most humans do not have the strength to keep up their faith in this way of denying bread when faced with severe hunger and other plaguing earthly pleasures. It does go through the next two temptations, but I won't go through all three to save some of the juicy stuff for when you read it, or if you have already read it, but in a sense what is being discussed is you have to force people to believe in you in order to maintain peace because Otherwise, with a freedom of choice, people will choose not to believe in you. It's a paradox in the sense that you want to rule by love, but that doesn't work, and without a firm controlling hand, people will waver. In fact, only the strong will remain devout, like Aloysia, like Father Zosima. In a sense, humanity needs security more than freedom and Christ should have known this before giving humanity spiritual freedom. The Inquisitor then goes on to say that the Church corrects the teachings of Jesus and actually does the work of Satan, not to be evil, but as a way to seek the best for mankind. Place everyone in a box and let them discover the freedoms from within that constructed box. The passage ends without Christ speaking. Instead, he kisses the Inquisitor without rebuking any claim the Inquisitor has made. He doesn't just think about practicing unconditional love, he acts it, he displays it, regardless of who the person is, this growing duality between words and action. It doesn't matter what you believe, what matters is how you act, and so there becomes this dichotomy between Aloysia and Ivan because Aloysia is not an intellectual guy compared to his brother Ivan. He's not as good looking, he's betrayed to be not as physically strong, etc, etc. Aloysia is this monastic person who has faith, whereas Ivan is this reason-driven individual to the point that he goes at Aloysia's faith. He goes at Aloysia himself, and what we see is that Aloysia doesn't have the intellect to refute these thoughts, these ideas but what we do see throughout the remaining course of the novel is how it does not matter what you believe. What matters is how you conduct yourself. You can believe in God, but if you act as a terrible person, you are a terrible person. If you are an atheist, but you are a really nice person, you are a really nice person. And it is important to remember that murder is murder, no matter who you are. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today, just teasing out this forthcoming murder and all the disaster that comes from it. The novel has set itself nicely to delve into this idea of responsibility. We have had a lot of chatter about what responsibility looks like and is, but it is one thing to talk about it, to debate it, 
but what happens when you have to put it into action? Tune in next week to a novel review part two of The Brothers Karamazov. 